The Bible is a magnificent book. There are people that think that they can just take the New Testament and leave the Old Testament behind. You lose so much of the richness of the Word if you do that. The Bible is such a complete book and it is so deep in its spirituality that you will never, ever, ever be able to exhaust what it has to offer. It's impossible. And every single verse in the Bible is loaded with meaning. Jesus referring to the Old Testament said these scriptures, these are they that testify about me, he said. They're all about Jesus. So the Bible isn't just a historic book. It gives you the history of origin. It gives you the history of the battle forces that were involved in the battle between good and evil corroborated by archaeology and all of those magnificent finds. It's not only a book of origins and history. It's a book of salvation. It's a book of salvation. It's a book of prophecy. There are so many aspects from which we can study the Bible. It's unbelievable. Every single story in the Bible must have at least three applications, except for those that are direct, historic, and origin-based. So we have, for example, in every story we have a typology. A typology is an enactment of a greater truth that will follow afterwards. So we have typology. Then we must have eschatology. And Eschatology is a future view of what is happening. And then every story in the Bible must have soterology, which means it must have an aspect of salvation in it. So every story, when you read a story in the Bible, ask yourself, what does this tell me about salvation in Christ? What does it tell me about a greater reality to follow? And what does it tell me about eschatology of future fulfillment of prophecy? What does it tell me? And if I put that package together, then we must always remember that the rule is never going to be broken because this is the Bible. This is not some ordinary book. So if we find it in typology... If we find the soteriology in it, the story of salvation in Christ in it, and we find it in typology, then we must apply it to eschatology, and the typology must tell us about the events. If we do that consistently, then we won't get lost in the quagmire of prophetic interpretation. And uh, one of the issues of eschatology is, what will be the mark of the beast? How will it be applied? Is it a question of a chip, which is the modern theology, or has it to do with the law of God? Has it to do with salvation and transgression of God's law? And we can find that answer only if we carefully study Typology. Here you have Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. This is salvation. He is being called out of the world to be a peculiar treasure. Verse 5 says, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now on the left over here, you have an exhibit in the British Museum. And... Uh, 
jewelry from Ur. If you thought women were adorned in these days, I've got news for you. These women in Ur were something else. They were fantastically beautiful. And Sarai was one of the exhibit A's in beauty. And she is a bride. She is a bride married to a type. Fascinating story. There's a typology in every sub-typology in every sub-little story. It gets so mind-boggling you could have a whole night's lecture just on this story. But here he is being taken out of this land where the culture was extremely developed. Imagine if the women walked around like this. This was gold. Not fake make-believe stuff. And he calls him out and he says, go to Canaan. And there he goes and he behaves and he listens to the word of the Lord and he leaves and he goes to Canaan. And even Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem in the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was in the land and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Here is an eschatological promise. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. So Abraham built an altar. He'd come out of his comfort zone. He'd gone into the land of Canaan. And he was surrounded by heathens. And he built an altar. And he showed the way to salvation. Salvation in Christ through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So he witnessed to the Canaanites about his faith. And there builded he an altar to the Lord who appeared unto him, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. He was different to all the others, he had been called out and he was witnessing. This is the story. In the land of Ur, round about here somewhere, which is the place where Babylon would have been. And then the Bible says, And Abraham journeyed, going on still towards the south, and there was famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Genesis 12, verse 9 to 10. So here he is, and he's running out of supplies. And he says, oh, I need a safe way. <laughs> and we're not going to get it here. You know, this is the backwaters. Uh, we come from Ur. Let's go down into Egypt. And let's go and Take care of our needs right there. I'm going to have a problem because, you know, Sarai, you're beautiful. And I'm going to get into trouble over there. So we read, And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he had said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. The New King James says, A woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So he showed tremendous trust in his relationship with God. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Now he wasn't lying because she really was his sister through his father's side, but uh, she wasn't really his sister, so he bent the truth. That it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was fair of beautiful countenance. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake. So Abraham gets treated well. 
And he had sheep and oxen and he had asses and men, men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And then the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Typology. Pointing to eschatology. Great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. What was the problem? Why couldn't he take his wife? It was against what? Against God's law. Which law in particular? Seventh commandment. So here was the law of God and here was a transgression of the law at stake. Uh, who's the real guilty party in this? Abraham is the real guilty party. And Sarai, Sarai goes along with it. And she puts on her harem clothes and she doesn't say a word and off she goes. She goes along with it. And there she is. And Pharaoh gets plagued. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she was my sister, so I might have taken her to be my wife? Now therefore behold thy wife. Take her. Go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Good grief. Here is Abraham. He walks down to Egypt. There is no command, go to Egypt, where you can find a, a supermarket that will satisfy your needs. He doesn't build an altar because he's, he knows he's in trouble. He doesn't want to demonstrate this. He built it in Canaan, where God said go, but he doesn't build one here. And then there is a transgression of God's law at stake. He is trembling with fear. He really deserves a bonk on the bean. But Pharaoh gets hit with a plague. And Abraham marches out with his wife and all his substance. And he walks out mega rich. There's the story of salvation. In a nutshell, typologically. We are all sinners. We are called out of the land of Ur and we're told to sojourn with Christ along the path. We stumble and we fall upon the, the way. We go down to Egypt. We are scared about who we are and what we are and we hide behind our facades. God reads the heart and he knows. Abraham knows this is transgression. I, I know that Abraham will have sat in a quiet corner and wept. I would have. I would hate Pharaoh to cast his beady little eye upon my wife. <laughs> and I would really, really have to be scared witless to allow something like that to happen. And so that was his situation. And off he goes. And then comes deliverance. Abraham deserves the plagues. He's not that much better than the others. But he knows God. He knows God's law. He wants to do it in his heart. He's not absolutely magnificent. Plague fall on Pharaoh. And he departs with great riches. And so Jesus Christ, will let the plagues fall on those who do not have God in their heart, transgress God's law, yes, but those who acknowledge Him will receive great riches. They will have won the great pearl of great price. Wonderful story. And he went with all that he had. Now, let's go a little bit into history. And let's go into the time periods involved. Sinusaret III. He is the fifth king of the 12th dynasty. And in that period, this was a high time in the Egyptian dynasty. There is his Kardush. His son and successor, 
was a co-regent together with him, and his name was Amenenhet III. So we have a ruler, we have a co-regent. Sennacherib is probably the best attested king of the new kingdom. He ruled the country for perhaps as long as 37 years as the fifth pharaoh of the Egypt's 12th dynasty from around 1878 to 1848, and that fits square into the chronology. And he was the king, this was this king's birth name, was Sennacherib. He was also a man of the Gazette, goddess Vosseret, so there's a goddess involved. He's also sometimes referred to as Sevoseret III or Sennacherib III or by the Greek as Sesostris III. So here is this man. There's a pharaoh, there's a co-regent, there's a goddess involved. He has the Sphinx to Sennacherib III. Here is Amenet III, that's his co-regent and his son. And this is what it says, what he wrote, what's... Sennacherib wrote, he said, Now as for every son of mine who shall maintain this boundary, which my majesty has made, my majesty has made, he is my son, he is born of my majesty, the likeness of a son, who is the champion of his father, who maintains the boundary of him that begat him. Now as for him, who shall relax it and shall not fight for it? He is not my son, he is not born to me. And his son, Amenot, Het the third heeded this warning, and interestingly, Sennacherib the third was later deified in Nubia as a god. So that's history. This was the pharaoh, and you know, if you look at him, he was pretty lucky with them ears to get a woman like Sarai. But anyway, there was a pharaoh, there was a co-regent, there was a goddess involved. The law of God was involved. Transgression of God's law was involved. There were plagues. There was a deliverance with great substance. He that should have gotten a hiding walked away with great substance. Fortunately, Abraham learned his lesson. He never did anything like that ever again. Genesis chapter 20 verse 2. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. He comes to another king. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. Good grief, he did it again. <laughs> and Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. I'm not reading the whole story. He also realized here was a problem and his house was plagued and here he walks off again with great substance. Genesis 20 verse 16, Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. She was rebuked as well. Abraham, and she was rebuked. But they walk off with great substance. They are delivered, these imperfect lovers of God, Wanting to do what is right, demonstrating the plan of salvation, being weak and failing, end up with great substance of delivering, deliverance. Unbelievable. Second time round. Genesis 26 verse 5 says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Good grief. Did he do it so well, yes or no? No, but it must have been in his heart. And who is the judge of that? God. Romans 4 verse 3, For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Did he believe absolutely in God's protection? No. And don't we, when times get tough also, say, where was God? in this? Don't we have that? Same experience? Exactly the same. So take heart. He deserves a hiding. He walks off with great riches. 
Galatians 3, 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture which was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. So God takes our weakness into account. So here we have a nice typological story and you will remember the details. Now type can have an antitype which can have another antitype and another antitype and another antitype and an antitype is always greater than a type. So the fulfillment of the first typology must be greater than the previous one and it must give us more details. So now let's go to another pharaoh. And this one was the mightiest pharaoh of all times. And his name was Tutmosis III. And he's the one who said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord. I will not serve him. And here he is depicted in this relief where he's marching over his enemies, picking them up by the scruff of their hair and trampling upon the soldiers. The Napoleon of Egypt, the mightiest pharaoh of all time, the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, who died on the exact date of the Exodus. Interesting. And he had a co-regent, his son, Amenhotep II, who happened not to be in Egypt when the plagues fell on Egypt, and therefore he was spared. But his firstborn son died. And here is his statue with the relief, all is well in my kingdom, all is at rest. When he was infuriated upon his return, and went and slaughtered a whole bunch of people, tied their heads to his, his boat and sailed it down the Nile for everyone to see. He was infuriated because all the slaves were gone. His firstborn was dead. And he was a co-regent. Now, the story thickens. All is well in my kingdom. All is at rest. The Egyptians are very much like the Russians. They will tell only what they want you to know. So I've used this example if, before, but if something explodes in space, they will say we successfully tested an explosive device. And so here he's saying all is well. This is the tomb of Tutmosis III where they found this fake mummy, which is the mummy of a 20-year-old rather than of an 80-year-old. Because they couldn't find the real one. He's somewhere buried in the Dead Sea, on the Red Sea. And here in his tomb, the priest throwing down his staff and it turning into a serpent. Fascinating story. And uh, here is Amenhotep or Amenophis II. That's his co regent, that's his son. And here you have the relief of Isis. We have a goddess giving him unk, life. He receives his life from a goddess. We have a regent. We have a co-regent. We have a goddess. And now we get to a little interesting story. Here is the relief of, in this tomb of the Book of the Dead, the Umdayat. Now this, Pharaoh, Tut Moses III, was the high priest also, so he was a religio-political leader, and he worshipped the dead. Fascinating. So there you have the book of the dead in the tombs. Osiris, the god of the dead, Tat Moses III, attributed with the Umdayat, the guidebook of the dead, there is Isis and Horus, and the worship of all these things. So here was a pantheon of Egyptian gods, and this pharaoh was fascinating. Here you have Anubis, the god of mummification, who receives the dead, is basically an acronym of Osiris, the god of the dead. But Tut Moses favored another deity. The top di deity in the Egyptian pantheon was the god Amun. 
And Tutmosis favored another god in the pantheon, namely Re Herakti, the sun god. And so he raised him up to the head of the Egyptian gods. Now all the deities were always honored with two obelisks, but Re Herakti was to be the one supreme one, one obelisk. So here we have an interesting story. You have a pharaoh, you have a co-regent, there's a goddess involved, and he changes the religion of Egypt by raising the sun god to the head position in the place of Amun in the Egyptian hierarchy of gods. And there is the relief of Reherakti, and it's also the one that a high priest of it threw the serpent. Uh, or the rod, and it became a serpent. He has a relief where he is dedicating, Tutmosis III is dedicating a temple to this new top deity, Re Herakti, the sun god. Interesting, Tutmosis III was later worshipped and deified as the incarnation of Re Herakti. So the previous pharaoh, Senusret was also deified, and this one is deified. So he's a god king. He changes the religion. He raises the sun god to the position of dominance. And what is the battle about? Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Exodus 5, 1 to 2. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get ye to your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest. And the word rest there is the word Shabbat, from their burdens, Exodus 5, 4 to 5. So here's a Pharaoh, a deified religio-political leader who, with a co-regent who raises the sun god to the pre position of preeminence, and he makes a law. He says, you will not Shabbat, you will work. He makes an anti-Sabbath law. Shabbat, to rest, desist, to keep, observe the Sabbath. So Moses had reintroduced the law of God, Sabbath-keeping, and Pharaoh made an anti-Sabbath law. When Pharaoh made an anti-Sabbath law, how did God answer him? Plagues. Plagues. He's messing with God's law. Plagues. So, blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, firstborn. Please note that four of them will be repeated in the final seven plagues. So this is eschatology and this is typology demonstrating an eschatology and the eschatology must be in harmony with the typology. So the first typological story, you didn't have much detail. You knew it was the law of God. You knew the guilty parties and you knew that the one was delivered with great riches and the other one received plagues. Hear the same thing? Moses was so righteous he never put a foot wrong. Did you know that? Or did he? Yes, he was a murderer. He killed someone. He had his black belt in karate. And he went, Gah! and then he buried him in some sand that nobody should see him. So he wasn't perfect. 
But the story is that they come out with great substance and he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness and gave them the lands of the heathen and they inherited the labor of the people that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. Psalms 105, 43 to 45. And all the riches of the Egyptians were taken and given to the children of Israel who murmured and muttered and groaned and rebelled and were pathetic. And yet they were delivered with great substance. We serve a wonderful God. We serve a wonderful God. And fascinatingly, and the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And in this way I will test them that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. This is before Sinai. Exodus 16 verse 4. And here the manna falls. And it falls every single day. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Fascinating. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. Exodus 16, 29. Here the bread falls. And every day they go and gather it. And if they try to gather for two days, what happens? It gets rotten. But on the sixth day... There is twice as much they can gather for two days and it does not get rotten. So every Sabbath there's a miracle and the bread does not get rotten. What does the bread stand for? It stands for the body of Christ. So the manna falls, it stands for the body of Christ. On the sixth day there's twice as much and it lasts right through the Sabbath. And on the first day, there is bread again. When was Christ therefore crucified and preserved according to the typology? On what day? Friday. Are there people that claim there was a Wednesday crucifixion because he had to be three days and three nights in the grave? Yes or no? That's a typological travesty. It cannot be. Or else the manna on Wednesday would have had to last until Sunday morning. Typology tells me it cannot be like that. Now the Bible says, I will not let my Holy One see corruption. Jesus had no corruption. He did not decay. Why not? Every scientist will tell you that even a day or a night is not enough to prevent decay. The minute you die, the second you die, decay sets in. But here was a miracle. The manna was by miracle kept from decay. And so Christ was kept by miracle from decay, just like the manna. But here they go. What was the issue? The issue was the law of God. They were taken out. They were given the plan of salvation in type. So here we have soteriology. Jesus Christ and his salvation in the manna. We have the transgression of the law of God, in particular an anti-Sabbath law. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Exodus 16, 28. This is... Salvation in Christ in typology. Fine. Second typological story. We have some more detail. Again, we have the law. We have a specific law. A very specific law. The Sabbath law is at stake. The plagues fall on Pharaoh. There's a co-regent. There's a goddess. There's a change of religion. And the Pharaoh is a religio-political figure. Fascinating, isn't it? Now let's go a little bit further. The Ark of the Covenant and the Temple of Dagon. Here are the priests of Dagon. They have the fish mitre on the head. And the Philistines take this Ark and 
they put it into their temple. When the Philistines, 1 Samuel 4 verse 6, heard the noise of the shout, they said, What mean is the noise of this great shout in the camp of Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. So they're scared that this ark is God. And they say, Woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing here to fall. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians. With all the plagues in the wilderness, be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that you be not servants unto the Hebrews. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. Why was Israel smitten? They went and fetched the ark because they were being beaten by the Philistines and the great shout went up. Now the ark is here. We've got it made. They trusted in the ark to be delivered and they were beaten miserably. Don't trust in idolatry. Trust in God. There's no thing that will save you. So the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten and they fled every man into his tent and there was a great slaughter for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Don't trust in things. Don't trust in false religion to deliver you. And the ark was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were slain. Sad story. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. They took the ark of God. What does the ark of God contain? The law. the law. So they took the law of God in the ark, and they subjected it to another deity, Dagon, the fish-mited God. And when they of Ashtod arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the Lord, before the ark of the Lord. Kufi, there he falls. And they set him in his place again. Verse 4, chapter 5 says, And when they arose early in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left. Three little bundles. A stump, hands, head. Three little bundles. Don't try and subject the ark to someone else, to another deity. And so they put it on the cart with the young cows that had just given birth and were certainly not going to run in a different direction from their calves. And they said, if they run, then we know. And off they went all the way back. The hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashtot and he ravaged and struck them with what? Tumors, plagues. Both Ashtod and his territory. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of the Lord, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering, and then you will be healed. And it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats, which ravage your land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand upon you from your gods and from your land. And then do you harden, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? You see the links? When he did mighty things amongst them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? Typology. The law of God, taken, subjected to another deity, Takes. Which deity? Dagon. Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, Asherah, Ashtoreth in some translations. This is a Baal temple and uh, fascinating. This is at Baal Bek. Let's read this story. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Again, we have the commandments of the Lord at stake. 
Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto the Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, that's Asherah. So we have a female deity, priests of a female deity, and we have prophets of Baal, and they eat at Jezebel's table. We have a woman, and the woman in typology is a church, and in Revelation, there's a woman in the middle church called Jezebel. And she is into sun worship. And she led the children of Israel into sun worship. She was a Phoenician princess. And Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt thee between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. 1 Kings 18, 19 to 21. I don't know whether she looked like that, but who knows? 2 Kings 9, 20. We know how the story goes out. Jezebel has a tantrum. Elijah runs away. All of these issues... Prophet prophesies what will happen to Jezebel. Eventually it happens. I'm not going to go through the whole story. The law of God was at stake. There was a woman. There was a Jezebel. There were two sets of priests. Now when Yehu had come to Israel, Jezebel heard of it. He came to sentence her to death, as it were. And she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. One translation says she enlarged her eyes. So she was using all these external little things. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses and he trampled her underfoot. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. And then he said, go now see this accursed woman and bury her for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more, no more of her than the skull, the feet, and the hands. Three little bundles. Doop, doop, doop. Three little bundles. Let's go to a second Elijah. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you, Elijah is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. Matthew 17, 10 to 13. So here's a typological story. The Elijah story was a type. Here was a fulfillment in anti-type. And there will be a final fulfillment and final Elijah who will restore all things, an antitype of an antitype. Okay. This is the place where he baptized Jesus. This is the very spot where they say it happened in Israel. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His message is, we're living in judgment time. Repent. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophets Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make paths straight, his path straight. And the same John had raiments of camel hair and leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about the Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said unto me, O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits me to repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. You are not salvation, you have no salvation by lineage. You're not saved because you belong to a particular church, a particular group, or or whatever, or because you have the ark with you. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And then he rebukes Herod. 
because he has taken his brother's wife as his wife. Is there a transgression of the law here? Yes. The second Elijah, there's a transgression of the law. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. The Bible doesn't even acknowledge him as the wife, her as the wife of Herod. So now we have an interesting story. We have a woman. We have a ruler. Herod. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. You're breaking God's law. We have God's law at stake again. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So there was a little plot. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, that was Salome, danced before them and pleased Herod. We have a woman. We have a daughter. We have a king. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she want, she would ask. And she being before instructed of her mother, so the mother instructs the daughter, she dances before the king. Who dances? The mother or the daughter? The daughter. Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And here's the relief. Salome dancing before King Herod. This is the place, Mukavir, where John the Baptist was beheaded. This was one of the strongholds. This is the precise locality where this happened. This is where Herod was. And this is where John the Baptist had been kept. Okay, now we've had a number of typological stories. Each one of them had certain characteristics. Now let's go to this power. The little horn power. He will think to change times and laws. Daniel 7 verse 25. So he'll basically say, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So he says he can do it in his own writings. The Pope's will stands for reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. Pope Nicholas quoted. The Bible calls this woman Mystery Babylon the Great. And uh, here is a relief from Babylon. And here is this young lady holding a cup in her hand. And you thought the mini skirt was a modern invention? I have news for you. There is nothing new under the sun. And here were the priests of Baal and Dagon. And they wore a mitre on their heads. Here is a priest. And here was the mitre of the priests of Dagon. And here is the mitre of this priest. Is it possible that he will take the law of God and put it in his temple and subject it to Dagon. Here are the high priests of Baal worship, priests of Dagon with their water, their holy water that they sprinkle. There's the symbol of the sun god, deity, with the waves coming down and the wavy waves, which means it's female aspect of the deity. A high priest of Dagon, a high priest today. Oh, a whole host of them. <laughs> All wearing the mitre of Dagon. And here is the temple, the great shrine. Revelation 17, verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And when you walk into the Vatican, the symbol of the dragon is everywhere. 
because it is the symbol of Rome and it is in the papal crest. It is the symbol of the Vatican. So placing God's law in Dagon's temple, the Dagon priests with their fish mitre hats, and here is a modern Dagon priest with a fish mitre hat. Is he a God king? He claims he can change God's law. And what did he do to religion? Of all the pagan cults, that of Mithras was the most formidable rival of Christianity. So I'm quoting history to you. On which is exerted a noticeable influence. Many of current practices come from Mithraism. The 25th of December was the birthday of Mithras. The first day of the week, dedicated to the sun, was his holy day, as opposed to the Jewish Sabbath. The Mithraics also practiced baptism with the blood of a bull and confirmation and expected salvation from a Eucharist Last Supper. The Mithraic ethic, like the Christian, was aesthetic and pure. So here was a form of godliness, but a totally different religion, and it was a sun worship. And here is Mitra, and he seems to have a nice relationship with this eagle. Hmm. Being hypnotized there. There are seven grades of Hitmitraism, and you go through all of them, and the highest is Father, under Saturn. And there you get a congregation. So the priests who had a congregation were called Father. Do we have a religion like that today? It was possible for a Mithraic initiate to be a member of more than one cult. Does this religious system have more than one religious order within its ranks? Can you choose to be a Dominican, a Jesuit, or a Franciscan, or whatever you want to be? Yes, you can. In AD 70, Titus and his legions descended on Jerusalem, reducing much of it to rubble together with its beautiful temple. Sixty years later, the Jewish nationalists tried it again. Under Bar Koshba, a false messiah, again they lost, and in 135, Jerusalem suffered a second, even more thorough destruction when the emperor Hadrian annihilated the Jewish state. And the Romans were sick and tired of all these Jewish wars. Now this is history. And all the quotes are there. In the second century, the Romans changed their weekly calendar. Please note, second century, the Romans changed their weekly calendar. The traditional sun god, Apollo, had not been the chief god. Jupiter was the chief god. And so the second day was dedicated to the sun. But now, because of Mithraism, the sun god had grown more important and the week was revised to make Sunday the first day of the week. Hmm. Calling it Dear Solace, Day of the Sun. And so Sunday came into existence. The Jewish wars in AD 66 to 70 and the Second Jewish Revolt in AD 132 to 135 caused tremendous anti-Semitism in Rome. And in AD 135, the Emperor Hadrian outlawed Jewish worship and Sabbath keeping. Ah, so here's a law. And it's a Roman emperor and he says, you will not keep the Sabbath. And he changes the deities. He takes the second deity of the pantheon, elevates him to the first place and changes the weekly cycle to make Sunday the first day of the week. Dedicated to Mitra. This caused the crisis for Christians who felt compelled to distance themselves from the Jewish religion. The precedent set by the Roman calendar changed and enabled the Christians to follow suit and shift their worship from the seventh to the first day of the week, thus extending the annual Easter Sunday to a weekly Easter celebration. If you want to verify it, here's the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Jewish War, AD 66 to 70, aroused tremendous anti-Semitism. And then it talks about the Emperor Hadrian, and at the conclusion of the war in which many Romans perished, a furious Emperor Hadrian issued a decree to outlaw Jewish worship, particularly Sabbath-keeping. So here came a crisis. 
So this was the first anti-Sabbath law that the church had to face. And at that time, believers generally were still observing the seventh day in accordance with one of the Ten Commandments. Instead of enduring the test, however, the Pope, supported perhaps by a majority in the Roman congregation, took a radical step. He changed... What did he do? He changed their day of worship to Sunday. He extended the Easter celebration into a weekly observance. If pagan Romans would shift the Sunday from the second to the first position, then Christian Romans could move the Lord's Day from the seventh to the first. So here they shifted the day of worship. The fateful decision to bring in a regular Sunday keeping was made in the time of Telosophorus, 125 to 136, when he headed the Church of Rome. He died within a year of Hadrian's edict. His successor was Hignius, 136 to 140, and the new day of worship was firmly entrenched by the time of Pius I. So here they changed something. Interesting what Justin Martyr wrote to the emperor, and he was a Christian. He said, a contemporary of Pius, he writes, in his irrational for Sunday keeping, to the emperor Antonius Pius, about 150 A.D., Sunday, dies dolus, is, solus, is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. Now this is interesting. Mitraism, Encyclopedia Britannica, Justin Martyr and others like him found a good deal of common ground between Christianity and Mitraism the cult of Sol Invictus, the unconquerable son. Easter was a commemoration of the pass of the pass that took place and the pass feast and all that was pertained to it. And how did it happen that it always had to fall on a Sunday? An early example was the demand by Pope Victor that all should celebrate Easter on Sunday. He went further, he excommunicated the Christians in the Roman province of Asia who continued observing it on Nisan 14, the date of the Jewish Passover. So Nisan 14 took place whenever the moon dictated that the month should be started. And so it could fall on any day of the week. Remember the Sadducees said, no, it always has to fall after a regular Sabbath, so it must always be on a Sunday. But the Pharisees kept it on any day, depending on which day it fell. So here, this man outlawed it. They insisted on following a calendar that God himself had instituted more than 1,500 years before. Indeed, they were stressing the crucifixion rather than the resurrection. For this reason, they were derisively labeled as quarto decimans, 14th, after the Latin word 14th, because they kept it on Nisan 14 and not necessarily on Sunday. So here they were keeping a Sadduceal law. If you want to check that, Sadducees, Sunday, Pentecost. The majority of Jews and early Christians followed the theology of the Pharisees calculating this date according to the Hebrew lunar calendar from year to year, both Nisan 14 and 15 fell on different days of the week. Some Jews, however, fo followed the positions of the Essenes and the Sadduceans, and they always kept it on a Sunday. The theologians of Nicaea also applied anti-Semitic rule in order to prevent the festival from coinciding either with the Jewish Passover or with a celebration of the quarto decimans, as they were called, special provision was made, should the full moon actually occur on Sunday, to defer the celebration of Easter until the next Sunday. And isn't it fascinating that Pope John Paul II did the same thing? And when Easter happened to fall on the same day as Nisan 14, he... Changed it by a week. This happened in 2001. Full moon fell on Sunday the 8th, April, which coincided with the Jewish Passover. Easter was therefore delayed for a week and celebrated on Sunday the 15th of April. So Sunday worship was introduced by 
the Romans and the Christian Romans followed suit and took a stand against those that followed the Jewish custom. Here you can read it in the Jewish Encyclopedia. It tells you that the, the Sadducees were the ones that kept it always on a Sunday. So this wasn't biblical. The papal invention of Easter Sunday was tinged with paganism. Nevertheless, at the Council of Nicaea, the Emperor Constantine supported it and imposed it on all his territories. His reasoning was also blatantly anti-Semitic. He wrote, let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. Now please remember that the Emperor, the title Pontifex Maximus has been referred, transferred to the papacy which today has that title and therefore is the emperor. Constantine, in spite of his conversion, he was almost certainly a Mithraic. His triumphal arch built for him after his conversion testifies to the sun god or unconquered sun. He never ceased to honor it, keeping its image on his coins. He also set up a statue of the sun god bearing his features in the forum and another of the mother goddess, Sibel, though she was presented in a posture of Christian prayer, and she was changed into Mary later. Constantine inherited the title Pontifex Maximus, which the bishop has now. He also added Bishop of Bishop, Vicarius Christi, all of the titles of the papacy. And he made a law. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. Edict of Constantine, A.D. 321. Now here's the interesting thing. That's a Sunday law. But that's not an anti-Sabbath law. What kind of law did Pharaoh make? He made an anti-Sabbath law. He said, you Moses, make the people rest. Get ye unto your burdens. Let's look at this Pharaoh, just a little bit later, 360 AD, the Roman Catholic Church makes this law. Christians shall not Judaize, keep the Sabbath, and be idle on Saturday, Sabbath original, but shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall especially honor. Council of Laodicea, Canon 29. What kind of law is that? that's an anti-Sabbath law and a Sunday law rolled in one. Okay. Let's go to the main church of the Roman Catholic Church. This is the chief church. This is St. John's Lateran. This is where the Pope speaks ex cathedra. This is where he was always crowned, except for the last two. The space got too small, so they had to shift it to St. Peter's. But this is the main church. This is the Imater Ecclesia, the mother church. There you have the phoenix rising from the ashes on its entrance porch, the Ecclesiarium, Imater, the mother of all the churches. And here's an interesting obelisk, which is standing next to the main church. Now, let's see where it comes from. Its location is Piazza Giovanni Laterano, that's at the Lateran Church. Who made it? Ooh, Pharaoh Tutmosis III. Height and weight. Inscriptions state that while it was begun during the reign of Tutmosis III, who was he? Pharaoh of the Exodus. It lay in a craftsman workshop for 35 years and was finally erected by his grandson Tutmosis IV. The only single obelisk ever put up in Karnak Temple. Did this pharaoh change his religion? No, he didn't change his religion, but he changed the pantheon order. And he put the sun god, Re Rakti, first. Did the Romans do a similar thing? Did they take a deity and put it in the place, the first place? Yes, Mitra. They put it in the place of Jupiter. And there it was. They changed the order. They made the first day the day of worship, the day of the sun. And they had a single obelisk then, and it was removed under the orders of the Roman Emperor Constantine, 
who hoped to raise it in his new capital, but he died before he could do it. And his son and successor, Constantius, had it taken to Rome, where it was re-erected in the Circus Maximus. At some unknown date and by some unknown cause, the obelisk fell. Oops. It was not until the 16th century that Pope Sixtus the fifth, on August the 3rd, 1588, after more than a year of effort, the Lateran obelisk was raised on the Piazza San Giovanni in Laterano, where it has stood ever since, a Christian cross at its apex. Tallest obelisk in the world, largest standing ancient Egyptian obelisk in the world, weighing 230 tons, originally from the temple of Amun in Karnak, where it took the place of a deity. Uh, is this law being subjected to another god and the day of worship being changed? Brought to Rome by Constantius II, 357, to decorate the spina of the Circus Maximus, found in three pieces in 1587. Three little leaves. Doof, doof, doof. I like this. This is fun. And there it is, fully restored. It's a little bit shorter than it was because he had to make one out of it. And there is the Kadush of Tut Moses III. It's really his. Fascinating. And we have a God, Mitraism, sun worship. And we have the eagle, just like Mitra embraces it. It's a symbol of Pope Pius, Pontifex Maximus. There's his whole title there in the Vatican. And he uses the same symbols. Remember that Tut Moses III is attributed with the guidebook of the netherworld, the Umduyat that embodied the worship of the dead. Remember this? Good. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore do greatly err. Mark 12, 27. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. God makes sure that there are three witnesses to testify that he is the God of the living. Veneration of the dead, consultation of the dead. There shall not be found amongst you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire or uses divination, observer of times, enchanter, a witch, a charmer, a consulter with a familiar spirits, a wizard, a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Have nothing to do with these dead. Anyone who came into contact with a dead person or a grave was considered unclean, could not partake in temple worship. Whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Numbers 19.16 The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests of the son of Aaron and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead amongst his people. Leviticus 21.1 Let's go to a cathedral. This is a place of sun worship. There's the symbol of the sun. There's the gargoyles, the symbol of demonology. There are the pillars, just as you had them at Stonehenge with a solar wheel in the front. And cathedrals are built on pagan sites where the dead were venerated and employed as mediators. You go into cathedral... You're walking on dead corpses. You're surrounded by corpses. You cannot say a mass without the bone or a relic of a saint under the altar. And there's a corpse under the altar. You have to have one. And as you walk in, you're walking over the corpses. And if you come to a Roman Catholic cathedral, there is the symbol of the God of death and the skull and bones, and you have a fraternity which is called skull and bones, and there you have Anubis, and there you have the phoenix rising out of the ashes. These are all Egyptian. And here in this monastery, you have the dead monks portrayed here, because Roman Catholicism teaches that each one of these holy monastics has virtue whereby you can gain virtue to augment your lack of virtue. So when you go and you pray in front of these bones or touch these bones, 
virtue is transferred to you and they make up for your shortcomings so that you can go to heaven. This is heathenism. This is paganism at its worst. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. There are two beasts. So there is a regent and there is a co-regent. They are also women. They are churches. Fascinating. Does the first beast receive worship? And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him. So we have a regent. We have a co-regent. We have a Herodias. We have a Salome. The USA. The second beast. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. Here is one representing the lamb, Christianity, but he speaks like a dragon. And the first beast spoke like a dragon, so it will be a persecuting power like the first beast. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, on his behalf, if you like, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Archbishop Quigley said, When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world said that in 1903. Typology tells me that when it comes to the final issue of salvation, the law of God will be at stake. Any particular law? What does typology say? The Sabbath in particular. There will be a regent, there will be a co-regent. There will be two women. And the one, the daughter, now who was called the mother of all the churches? Rome, we just read it in St. John's Latin. The mother will give instructions to the daughter and the daughter will dance before the king. Hmm. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. Abraham Lincoln. This is interesting history. It is the duty of nations, he said, as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God. And to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power as no other nation ever has grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. How spot on he was. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and that no man might buy or sell, say, if he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Can this be a computer chip? What does the typology tell me? The typology tells me that the issue is the law of God. That's the issue. And the plagues will fall. So the mark of the beast. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of this fact, Catholic record, September 1, 1923. So here is a mark of ecclesiastical power. She has changed the worship of God. She has taken God's law, subjected it to Dagon, shifted the day of worship, put a new deity in the first place and changed the order of deities, just like Tut Moses did, just like Rome did. Christians shall not Judaize. this is her law, this is an anti-Sabbath law, and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall especially honor, exactly the same as Pharaoh had done. 
There's a mystic alliance called Babylon, which has three components, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Everything that has to do with demonic activity, new age movement, spiritism, you name it. Out of the mouth of the beast, Catholicism, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And he's the one who has the miracles. And he's associated with the second beast. This is the daughter. Fallen Protestantism that has left the Lord and followed Baal and Asherah. For they are spirits of devil working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And he is the patience of the saints. He are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And Babylon came into remembrance and she received the plagues. And she fell into how many pieces? Three. Jezebel, three little heaps. Dagon, three little heaps. The obelisk of Tutmosis, three little heaps. Antitype, three little heaps. The threefold alliance of the false worship is broken apart and falls before the ark of God. Revelation 16, 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Uh, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah was a type of the end. The issue was the law of God. The absolute issue will be the Sabbath. Typology says it. It cannot be anything else. You may not violate the typology. There's a three angels message. The everlasting gospel, the hour of judgment has come. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, has become a house of demons and every unclean and detestable bird. Come out of her, my people. And do not accept this mark of the beast, this false worship, this replacing the deity of the Bible with another deity and another day. Just like Tutmosis did and just like Rome did. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And who's going to ask for the implementation of the mark of the beast? Is it the mother? Is it Herodias? Or is it Salome who will ask? And Salome will say, give me the head of the antitypical End time, Elijah. The daughter, the Protestant world, is going to ask the kings of the world, give me the head of the antitypical Elijah. And what will happen? God's law may not be kept, an anti-Sabbath keeping law will be promulgated, and the plagues will fall. And God's people will leave under the protection of the great I am. Because we are perfect? No, we are pitiful and blind and naked. <laughs> Study the typology and make sure whether perfectionism fits into the typology. If it does, goody for you. If it doesn't, then don't think too much of yourself. Don't think too much of yourself. We are all miserable, but I'm not saved on account of my perfection or my miserableness. I am saved because I have the law in my heart and I want to do what is right. I stumble and fumble. I give my most precious bride to Pharaoh. 
And God sees the turmoils in our lives and he says, come, I will deliver you. And I will give you all the riches. You will walk on streets of gold. You will have eternal life. You will come out with everything. Although you had nothing. Isn't that incredible? What a beautiful typology we have in the Bible. And let no one rob you of your eschatology. The eschatological fulfillment of prophecy has to be in accordance with the typology. The final issue will be the law of God. The final issue will be the Sabbath of the Lord. And the final issue will be a battle of the mother and the daughter against the antitypical Elijah who preaches the three angels' messages. And don't be afraid and don't be shaken by every wind of doctrine. Sit. This is going through to the kingdom. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen has become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. All the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We have a message to bear. Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. You make them keep the Sabbath. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of the place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26. Don't be perturbed by prophecies of rapture before the events. When you look at the typology, the Israelites were there. And here God's people will be there while all this turmoil takes place. But there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh their dwelling. There were ten plagues. The first three affected the Egyptians and the Israelites. The last seven, none. Fortunately, at the end, there are only seven. You will not be affected. If you stay faithful to God, they will not come near your house or near your dwelling. A thousand will fall by your side, ten thousand by your right hand. The plagues will fall. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The plagues fall. I really deserve the plagues. I'm a miserable specimen. <laughs> but by the grace of God, the plagues fall on Egypt. And I walk off with the greatest lotto win that anyone could win. The earth, the sea, the fountains, the rivers, the sun. The throne of the beast, the Euphrates, the air, the earthquake, the hail. That's the last plague. Now look at this here. Revelation 16 verse 17. And the seventh angel, that's the last plague, poured out his vial on the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done. What was it? It was the earthquake and it was hail. Let's go to Revelation 11:19, a parallel text. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. And there was lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. What plague is that? The last plague. And what is the issue of the final events? The ark of the Lord. Don't subject God's law to Dagon. Don't change his day of worship by shifting the cycle. Don't replace him with an inferior dear solace sun god Mithraism. And don't mess with his Sabbath. Don't receive the mark of this beast. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Don't be afraid to be an individual and to love the God more than the praise of men. Jesus is coming soon. The theology which we have preached for more than 120 years is verified by typology, eschatology, soterology. 
And we are not wonderful and great. 